Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight. I'm Paris Schutz. Coming up on the program, the outlook for Boeing after another high-profile crash, the latest on a pair of apparent coyote attacks, and the royal split known as Megxit. But first tonight, Governor J.B. Pritzker is defending his response to the latest Springfield scandal. It involves an email that appears to show key figures in Illinois government having conspired to cover up a rape. Chicago Tonight's Amanda Vinicky is here with the latest. Amanda, what did you learn today? Well, Paris, this all centers on an email written by a lobbyist named Mike McLean. He's not just any lobbyist. He is well known in the Capitol for his close relationship with House Speaker Michael Madigan. McLean has also been in the news because his Quincy home was raided by the FBI as part of an ongoing corruption investigation. McLean in 2012 wrote two of then Governor Pat Quinn's top aides to ask that the Quinn administration be merciful to a state employee because McLean wrote, the worker kept his mouth shut on Jones's ghost workers, the rape in Champaign, and other items. This email surfaced as part of a WBEZ investigation that involved using the state's Freedom of Information Act to request from now Governor J.B. Pritzker's office. All emails sent from McLean to the governor's office now and in the past. Pritzker calls this email horrific. There are two crimes that are uh, discussed in this email. One is rape and the other one is uh, ghost payrolling. And so I think all of us want to know what are they referring to because I don't think it's clear yet. The governor says his office promptly referred the matter to the state inspector general who serves as an internal watchdog for the executive branch. There are a lot of folks that want all kinds of action on this. Did the governor suggest any other kind of action into looking into this? Well, the governor says what he's done is best, that the most appropriate course of action is to have the inspector general determine if law enforcement needs to get involved. Reporters did press him. Given McLean's close association with the speaker, did he talk with Madigan about it? Should Madigan keep his other powerful position as head of their party, the Democratic Party of Illinois? Pritzker says he needs the facts. In the state of Illinois. Email and you don't call him up and say, what is this about? No, it's not his email. I, I, what I'm telling you is that immediately upon, you know, understanding that this needed to go to an investigatory body, it went to the OEIG. And that is, in fact, exactly where it ought to go. Now, that was from this morning. This afternoon, the governor's office said that Madigan called Pritzker. The governor's office says their conversation was limited to Madigan confirming that the matter had been sent to the inspector general. Amanda, Speaker Madigan doesn't give interviews much with the media these days. What has he said in response to this? Well, there's no indication that he's planning to resign or anything to that effect. He did issue a statement yesterday saying of the email, these are extremely serious and troubling allegations. I had no knowledge of the incident referenced in the story in only learned of this today. Again, that was yesterday. I encourage those with any information to come forward. Republicans want more. House Minority Leader Jim Durkin is asking the speaker convene a special legislative committee to probe the situation. I've heard a lot of outrage by the Democrats, a lot of this passive outrage, which I continue to hear from the House Democrats. Time to do something a little bit more. Instead of saying somebody needs to look into it, we should look into it. And I believe it's our inherent responsibility to get answers to this. Madigan this afternoon rejecting Durkin's request, writing that in recognition of the sensitivity of the matter for any potential survivors, any investigation should be handled by the appropriate investigative entities without interference by the General Assembly. Durkin says this is the first time he's seen Madigan abdicate his position and hide behind any governor and says he'll keep trying for this committee to be formed. Durkin says McLean's fingerprints have been all over every major law passed in Illinois for the past three decades, so it's imperative to the integrity of the chamber that Madigan oversees. Do something about it. I've given him an opportunity to do something about it. He can't shirk his responsibilities as the speaker. With his position come responsibilities, great responsibilities. The top House Republican also saying it's time for other Democrats to show some outrage and to demand action. Representative Kelly Cassidy, who at times has been openly critical of Madigan, says this is not the place for that. I don't know that a political body is the best place to explore criminal actions. Um, what I do know, again, is, you know, everything we think about with this has to go through the filter of what does this do to this victim? 
There are so many unknowns. Was there a rape of whom, by whom, and why the cover up? Cassidy says every time these questions are asked in the media, it is likely the victim, whoever that may be, relives the trauma. Cassidy says she does believe Madigan was unaware of what McLean was up to intentionally. She says that's how Madigan's political organization operates. It is fundamental to the design of the organization that he's able to say that every time. Still, Cassidy says everybody should take a step back and focus on the victim. She says Madigan has been around for a long time, most of her life, political life anyway, and there's no need to rush to focus on him now. And it seems like there has to be a handful of individuals that know what that email was referring to. We're just going to have to keep digging and find out. For sure. There's going to be a lot of digging into this situation by reporters, but also presumably authorities. All right. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And now to Phil Ponce with an economic forecast for 2020. Phil. Thanks, Paris. U.S. stocks closed at record highs today, possibly pointing to investor confidence as tensions with Iran seem to cool down, at least for now. Also on the international stage, China's Commerce Ministry says its negotiators will officially sign a phase one trade agreement in Washington next week. That deal reportedly cuts tariffs and boosts Chinese investment in U.S. agricultural products, although it hasn't been made public yet. Stateside Illinois reports more than $10 million in record recreational pot revenue in the first five days of legalization. Joining us, joining us to offer their insights on these topics and more are Edward Stewart, economics professor emeritus at Northeastern Illinois University, and Michael Miller, associate professor of economics at DePaul University. Gentlemen, welcome back. Glad to have you here in this, uh, in this new year. I'm going to ask you to uh, just uh, stretch a little about it outside of your specific field because nothing, as you know, exists in isolation. And, and Edward Stewart, let me begin with you. Uh, the stock market closed at record highs today, as we mentioned. Is that an indication that U.S.-Iran tensions have cooled? The, the stock market, as everybody knows, for the last several months has been going up and down and up and down on day-to-day -day news and um, it seems to me much more psychological than than economic and um, obviously nobody wants any kind of war and the only analogy I can draw is 1991 when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait and there was an oil crisis that precipitated the 91-92 recession so the less tension there are, there is between the United States and Iran, and the less tension there is between the United States and China, the better it is for everybody, including the U.S. economy and the U.S. stock market. Michael Miller, what kind of economic impact do you think the uh, this country's relationship with Iran could have? Well, economically, Iran is so small as a player in the world economy, it could almost have no effect. It wouldn't affect international trade and so forth. It would be, as Ed says, it would be completely psychological. The one fear is this economy is probably as good as it has ever been or as good as it can be. And the one thing that would push it off its um, equilibrium would be some kind of a shock. So the, the big concern would be, could a war be that shock? And I'm kind of, of course, hoping that there would be no war or there would be no shock that would lead to uh, a recession kicking in. Uh, again, this is slightly outside of your uh, realm of, uh, realm of uh, expertise, but uh, do you think economic sanctions, do economic sanctions tend to work against a country? It depends on how well they're targeted and, and if the leadership is going to be caring about how the people are affected by those sanctions. If the leadership does care about the people of Iran, which is suffering dramatically because of uh, existing sanctions, then maybe they would begin to behave more like a normal country instead of one which is spreading terrorism across the Middle East. So sanctions are a political action. They have minimal effects on us in terms of the economics. It could have dramatic effects upon the Iranians themselves. Edward Stewart, your take on that? I think the history of sanctions, the sanctions that we imposed in, on Iraq and the sanctions that we have already imposed on Iran have been felt almost entirely by the common people. Mm -hmm. I don't think the leadership. The only sanctions that are relatively effective are the Magnitsky sanctions against the Russian top leadership, which is why Putin is so adamant about getting Trump to let those sanctions go. But and what were those? I don't, I, the remind us. The Magnitsky Act was passed because of a, a particular um, Russian um, lawyer who was working for Bill Browder who was murdered in, in Russian captivity. And as a, as, a, as a punishment for that kind of breach of human rights and legal, the uh, U.S. Senate uh, 
under the leadership of John McCain, actually, passed a series of sanctions against specific Russian oligarchs that, that, that prevent them from coming to the United States and accessing some of their, their money. Those sanctions seem to, seem to work, but the sanctions we apply against nations tend to make the common people poor and, and tend to make the governments rich that, that evade the sanctions through black markets and smuggling. Let's get back to the stock market, sure. Michael Mueller. What else is fueling the rise? I mean, as you look at the elements that go into mm -hmm. this, uh, this, this market that seemingly, as you mm -hmm. say, is as good as it gets, yep. what is making it as good as it gets? Well, of course, the price of a stock is based upon information, and, and among that information would be the productivity and the profitability of the firms which they're buying. And the profitability of firms right now is, is doing pretty well. So people are buying into firms that they think are going to continue to do well. And then you also have to look at where the other alternatives are. Where else can you put your money? If you have three choices and one of them has a much higher return and you have more confidence it will be strong, that's where you put your money. And so we do see that, that the stock market is a place that lots of people are still putting Lots of cash. Edward, so let's talk about what's expected to happen next week, and that is Chinese negotiators are expected to be in Washington to sign what's being called a phase one, a phase one economic deal, which you mentioned reportedly includes cutting tariffs and pushing for Chinese investment in U.S. agriculture. Uh, does that sound like uh, looking at the bones of what we think we know? Does that sound like a sensible approach? It's, it certainly is, and, and it would be positive for the, especially the U.S. agriculture sector, which has been hurting tremendously in the last couple of years because of the retaliatory tariffs by the Chinese. And the Chinese have switched to buying soybeans from Brazil, which has uh, obviously damaged the incomes of farmers in Illinois and the central part of the United States. Um, to kind of add on to what Mike said about what could tip the the economy into a recession or turn the economy badly. The, the farm sector is in very bad shape in the United States and manufacturing is in bad shape in the United States because of the retaliatory tariffs uh, imposed by the Chinese and the Europeans um, against the tariffs that we put on on their products. So um, the stock market's in good shape but the economy is not in, in as good a shape as the stock market. Michael Miller, you agree that there's uh, troubling signs in the economy, even though the stock market itself there's, is doing fine? There's, there are two weak places. One is manufacturing, and it is tied to the trade problem, which maybe will get better now that if they, they can get this agreement through. The other one is that there's uh, a weakness in the spending by firms. But this is completely overshadowed by the strength of the consumer sector, the strength of the housing sector. And these two sectors alone are pulling the economy quite uh, strongly. And you also will see that the drag upon the economy of, of net exports, that drag is slowing down a bit because we have fewer imports that are, that are uh, lowering the amount of uh, net exports. And it, clearly, one thing that Ed and I have always agreed upon is that the self-imposed tariffs were a mistake. It's not a very good economic thing to do, but it was a political action. And it could be that we're actually going to reap some benefits if it gets China to behave better than uh, they did before. Uh, the, the labor market is another thing that seems to be doing pretty well. But, uh, Edward Stewart, give us a beat on that. The, yeah, I've been doing a lot of reading, especially by... Uh, uh, an economist, David Blanchflower at Dartmouth, who, ironically enough, is the Bruce V. Rauner Professor of Economics at, at Dartmouth. But Professor Blanchflower is much more liberal than, than that. And he's probably the best expert on the, on the under, underlying nature of the labor market. And um, even though the unemployment rate is at, at a historic low, there are other indicators of the labor market that say that it's not quite that good. The, Employment to population ratio, the so-called employment rate, is still below what it was before the recession and much lower than it was in 2000. In 2000, it was about 65 percent. Before the recession, it was 63 percent. Right now, it's 61 percent, which means that there are about 8 million jobs that could be filled if people had the right kind of work. There's a brand new study by the Brookings Institution that something like 44 percent of the American uh, workforce exists on about $10 an hour, $18,000 a year jobs. These are jobs in places that you would be know about, right? They're in restaurants, they're in retail, they're in hospitals and so forth. And so for a large part of the American population, things aren't that, that good, especially that those parts of the population, the labor force, 
that don't have college educations and don't have networks that are tied into urban labor markets <clears throat> like Chicago, like New York, like San Francisco, uh, that are doing pretty well. But outside of those big urban areas, um, there's some there's some pain. Mike Miller, I want to get to what's happening in Illinois. Uh, as, as you probably know, in the first five days of recreational marijuana sales, mm -hmm. the state, uh, the revenue was about, uh, well, the, about $11 million in sure. sale. To what extent do you think this is going to be a meaningful source of revenue for the oh, state? It's still a tiny fraction of the overall uh, budget of the state, and so it's not going to have a dramatic effect. It's going to have a positive effect any time that you, you, in a sense, count the underground economy. That's an improvement. We know exactly where the production is, and uh, that gives you a chance to both control it so that the quality is high, and it gives you a chance to tax it. So it's a net positive. And I'm pleased that they uh, passed the law and allow this to occur, even though I'm not a user myself. Um, so it, it'll generate some money. Not enough. This state isn't too big trouble to, for this to be the solution. Edward Stewart, Michael Miller, thank you for your observations about what is coming ahead in 2020. We very much appreciate it, as always. Thank you. And there's more Chicago Tonight just ahead, so please stay with us. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Allstate. Allstate is investing in Chicago's youth. We believe good starts young. That's why we're helping our youth develop the skills they need to achieve success in life. Allstate is proud to empower the next generation of leaders. A Chicago child has died from flu-related illness. The Chicago Department of Public Health reported this is the first pediatric flu-related death of the season in the city or the state. CDPH isn't releasing details about the child's death or identity, but he or she is one of 27 children across the country to die from the illness, which has claimed 2,900 deaths nationally. Officials say flu activity is high and at its peak and at its peak has resulted in more pediatric deaths earlier in the season than in previous years. For more ways to protect yourself this flu season, you may visit our website. Ending cash bail, reforming low-level crime sentences, and reducing excessive prison sentences are among the reforms the governor and lieutenant governor are considering as part of their criminal justice strategy. A lot of the uh, re-entry work that needs to happen for people returning back to their communities, which by the way is most people, most are returning to communities. We want to make sure that that return is successful. And so the re-entry work doesn't need to start two weeks before they exit the system or when they get to the community. That work needs to start much earlier. Lieutenant Governor Juliana Stratton heads the Justice, Equity and Opportunity Initiative formed by the governor to report on research to reform the state's criminal justice system. The first annual report was released last week. Its 2020 goals include improving conditions and addressing needs of vulnerable populations in prison like women and transgender inmates and improving reentry efforts to reduce recidivism. City officials are working to catch up to motorcyclists who drag race and stunt ride along Lakeshore Drive in city streets. Police and emergency management officials testified before the City Council Public Safety Committee today, saying they had the potential to use existing license plate recognition cameras to track and cite illegal group riders. The city currently has 17 of those cameras on Lakeshore Drive and 18 on Lower Wacker Drive. Additionally, 2nd Ward Alderman Brian Hopkins says the bikes are often illegally modified, so group drag racing can create noise louder than a jet plane taking off and landing. Alderman also discussed installing, installing noise monitors along the drive. As for the weather, tonight rain likely with a low around 40 degrees and breezy. For Friday, more rain likely with a high near 44 and falling over the day. Still to come on Chicago tonight, with the 737 MAX still grounded and another high profile crash in Tehran, what's the outlook for Boeing? The latest on the spate of coyote attacks and sightings in Chicago this week. Making sense of the announcement that Prince Harry and the Duchess of Sussex, Meghan Markle, are stepping back from the royal family. What do a train ride and an army parade have in common? Jeffrey Bear investigates two publicity stunts in tonight's Ask Jeffrey. And a student production that takes a look at African-American hairstyles and their influence on culture. But first, some of today's top business headlines from Cranes. Here's Danny Ecker. Brandis, a Texas developer, is set to make a bold bet in the Fulton Market District and hopes to jumpstart Chicago's life sciences industry in the process. 
Trammell Crow says it'll break ground this spring on Fulton Labs, a 400,000 square foot life sciences laboratory and office building at 400 North Aberdeen Street. It hopes to lure biotechnology and pharmaceutical companies born at Chicago universities to the now trendy corridor. If it does, it might help solve a lab space shortage in the city that has driven many homegrown life sciences startups to markets like Boston and San Francisco. Meantime, the public face of the giant Lollapalooza music festival is moving on. Lala operator C3 Presents confirmed co-owner and principal Charlie Jones, a key organizer of the annual four-day Grant Park event, is no longer with the company. C3 says Jones' departure won't mean any changes in the event for now, but Lala has faced more security and financial pressures in recent years, and sellouts haven't come as easily. The festival's current contract with the Chicago Park District expires next year. And finally, humanitarian and celebrity chef Jose Andres is teaming up with Chicago's Gibson's Restaurant Group to bring a new dining venue to Wacker Drive. They've leased a big space at the base of the new Bank of America Tower going up at 110 North Wacker Drive, where they'll open a fine dining restaurant, cocktail bar, and cafe. The 55-story skyscraper along the Chicago River is slated to open later this year. For Crane's Chicago Business and ChicagoBusiness.com, I'm Danny Ecker. Brandis, back to you. Thanks, Danny. And now back to Paris and the recent deadly disaster involving Boeing. Paris. Francis, thank you. It's the latest in a string of tragic news involving Chicago-based Boeing. Today, officials in Canada and the U.S. are saying the crash of a Boeing 737 jet outside Tehran early Wednesday morning may have been caused by an accidental Iranian missile strike. The crash killed all 176 on board and came just hours after Iran launched a missile attack on military bases in Iraq, where U.S. forces were stationed. Here's what Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau had to say earlier today. We have intelligence from multiple sources, including our allies and our own intelligence. The evidence indicates that the plane was shot down by an Iranian surface-to-air missile. This may well have been unintentional. This incident comes as Boeing tries to get back on its feet following the crash of two 737 MAX jets last year and the subsequent grounding of that plane. So what does the future hold for this Chicago-based company? Joining us now to share her take is Tracy Rosinski, Chicago-based U.S. aviation correspondent for Reuters. Welcome to Chicago Tonight. Thank you. So Tracy Rosinski, what do we know at this moment about the crash of this Boeing 787-800? Well, as you said, based uh, on what Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau said today and on evidence also cited by U.S. government officials, they believe that it was an Iranian missile that, that took down the jet. Um, hours before, Iran was firing missiles against U.S. military bases in Iraq. So the thought is that they were on the defensive for any um, reaction from the United States to those missiles and that may be why they could have mistaken that plane for for you know something that that they needed to defend against. And Iran has not officially confirmed that. Do we know Correct. that Iran and these other parties involved, Ukraine, Canada, Boeing will all be part of the investigation? We don't know. Iran, as you say, has denied that, that their forces took down the plane. They have invited um, Canada, the United States, Ukraine to take part in the accident investigation and to analyze the black boxes. Uh, it's not clear under U.S. sanctions uh, what to, to what extent the United States can participate in that investigation, but um, the National Transportation Safety Board is looking into it and Boeing has said that it will assist the NTSB in, in whatever role it has. When it first happened, it, it seemed like another string in terrible news for the company, Boeing, uh, not to mention a tragedy for the families and the people on board. Uh, but it seems like, at least for the company, its financial position won't be hurt as a result of this because it doesn't look like a, a manufacturing problem. Right, that's what it looks like at, at this point. So, the, so and, and can you tell us where the stock price is right now? So, so the stock is trading, I think, around $322. That's about $100 or so off of where it was uh, when the second 737 MAX crashed in March. Um, this has obviously been a blow to, to Boeing's uh, stock. Um, 
However, you know, they still do have a lot of orders for this plane, and the thinking is that once deliveries resume again, and Boeing starts to get payments for these jets that it will be able to to recover. And you're speaking of the 737 MAX, which was the plane involved in the Lion Air crash and the Ethiopian Air crash. So you do uh, believe that that the FAA will approve this plane to become airborne again? Well, it, it looks like that is the way things are headed, um, but there have been repeated delays in that process. Uh, as of now, um, we're, people are hopeful that by mid-February or March, the FAA will approve it. Uh, the U.S. airlines that, that fly the MAX, Southwest, American, and United, um, who obviously have, have grounded their planes um, as, as this ha has dragged on, um, they are not scheduling flights on the MAX until April in the case of Southwest and American and for United in June. So the thought is that once the FAA approves and they can train their pilots and, um, and install the software fixes that Boeing is working on, that they'll be able to put these jets safely back in the air. So they are banking that this will all be approved. What about uh, to passengers who may on their plane ticket see 737 MAX and get worried? How do you assuage their concerns once this is back in the air? So I mean, this is definitely something that, that the airlines and Boeing are looking into. The airlines have said that if any passengers are uncomfortable flying the plane that that they will accommodate them and they've said that you know if if they are if their pilots are confident in flying these planes that passengers should be confident as well but it remains to be seen what what the reaction is is going to be and as i understand some airlines might rebook passengers if they do feel nervous about it um you know there's been a big shake up in the corporate structure the the ceo uh, is gone uh, the former ceo muhlenberg is gone mm -hmm. Who came in to replace him, and, and what does that portend for the company? So David Calhoun, uh, who was chairman of the board as of a few months ago when Muhlenberg was stripped of that title, uh, starts next Monday as CEO. He is uh, a private equity executive at Blackstone. He's well known in the aviation industry. He served on Boeing's board uh, since 2009, I believe. Um, he worked for GE in their aviation unit. He knows the company. He's well respected, uh, but he has a lot of challenges uh, ahead this year. And, and coming from hedge funds or private equity, does that mean that he might have to start slashing um, at Boeing, cutting workers, cutting payroll? Well, so so the, the big issue for Boeing right now, they have uh, frozen production of the 737 MAX. This Which was, is a very crucial product for them, isn't it? it yes. Um, and and, and any, anything that a, a manufacturer does to its production line has huge ramifications across its supply chain. Uh, it is, uh, it, economists have estimated a 0.5% hit to U.S. GDP as a result of this. So this has national economic implications. Yes. And uh, so um, once, uh, once the FAA approves the jets to fly again, the belief is that Boeing will try to ramp up its production line again. Um, this is, is not an easy task. All right, Tracy Rusinski, thanks for sharing all this information. Thank you. And we're back with the latest on two coyote attacks in the city right after this. Don't ever miss Chicago Tonight. Subscribe to our podcast. Get a daily download of our show delivered to your desktop or mobile device. Go to WTTW.com slash Chicago Tonight podcast and subscribe. City and county officials are still on the prowl after two coyote attacks were reported in Chicago yesterday. That includes one incident involving a six-year-old boy in Lincoln Park who was bitten in the head. Animal care and control officials say coyote sightings certainly aren't rare around here, but attacks are. We want residents to understand that 
any attack is um, very, very rare. It, it hasn't happened um, in probably more than 10 years on a person. So what should you do when you see a coyote nearby and why are they so common in densely populated Chicago? Joining us is Seth Magley, director of the Urban Wildlife Institute at Lincoln Park Zoo. Seth, welcome back to Chicago Tonight. Thanks, happy to be here. So what do you know at this point about these two purported coyote attacks? To be honest, not very much. I've heard a number of different reports on this. I've, I've seen the reporting out from Animal Care and Control. We know that these two attack events occurred, but we don't know what precipitated them. We don't know uh, what it was that caused these attacks to take place, but we do know, uh, as was said, they're very rare. How, how rare? Put this into context where we hear about two separate attacks in a 24-hour period where we rarely ever hear about attacks. Yeah, I haven't heard about coyote attacks on humans in the city uh, in the time I've been here, which is almost 10 years. Uh, so this isn't something that happens commonly, even though uh, the coyote population seem to be very large and very healthy. Does it indicate to you that, that, that someone might have goaded the coyote on or, or, or maybe tried to feed the coyote? Yeah, it's all just wild speculation at this point, but I do suspect that something unusual happened. One example could be, as you said, someone was feeding those coyotes or that coyote. That can lead to these kinds of incidents. You also worry about something like disease, something that may be uh, influencing the animals in that way. And, you know, this young child that was bit, it was purportedly in the head. How severe can a coyote bite be? And, and is there concern that this coyote could be carrying rabies or some other disease? Yeah, it's extremely rare for coyotes to have rabies, but any mammal can have rabies, so it is something that you worry about. Um, you know, these, these instances are so rare that it's really hard to put them into some sort of a context, but any animal bite is extremely serious, and you would want to go uh, to seek medical attention for any sort of attack like that. Remind us why there are so many coyotes living with us here in Chicago. Yeah, that's really one of the great mysteries. Why do they do so well here? And that's something myself and my team work hard to try to understand. We know that they're very intelligent. We know they're very flexible in their behavior. They're able to adapt to new conditions like a city, uh, and they just seem to be doing very well. But for the most part, the reason they do so well is by avoiding us, by keeping away from us. And that's part of why this attack is, is so troubling and, and so confusing. And they typically only come out at night. Is that because they know that we're awake during the day and they don't want anything to do with us. Yeah, the major threat to a coyote in the city is a car. So they have learned that by staying active at night and by learning uh, certain behaviors like looking both ways before they cross the street, uh, they've learned to uh, sort of try to reduce those risks. So that is usually when they are most active. Now, Cook County government officials are also on the case here. They put out their list of things to do or tips uh, to deal with coyotes, namely, uh, you know, make sure you keep your small dogs away from them. Coyotes are interested in that. Don't leave food outdoors. Always supervise your animal. And if you do see a coyote, if it is coming up to you, make loud noises. Are these uh, the right things to be thinking about? Yeah, I think that's exactly it. But I would also make the point that just seeing a coyote, if it's not approaching you, if it's not acting unusually, is not any cause for alarm. And in fact, we like to try to remind people that these can be kind of positive, kind of learning experiences for people to watch wildlife in their neighborhoods. Uh, every time I've seen a coyote in the city, it's been moving very quickly away from me. And that is the normal coyote behavior. I've seen a pack of coyotes running down metro tracks and just kind of interacting with each other. It's fascinating to watch. So if animal care and control finds uh, the culprit here, how do they humanely um, capture it and then what do they do with it? Yeah, capturing coyotes is a very difficult job. People train for months or years. You have to mask your scent. You have to use very um, stealthy sort of capture techniques because they are so clever. They can see through a lot of our tricks, but animal care control is very good at their jobs. I'm sure, uh, I don't know exactly what approach they'll use, but I'm sure they're gonna use the most humane possible approach to try to remove this animal from this situation. I believe they said they're going to relocate it. So where, where do you think they would put it? Would it be outside of the city? It doesn't seem like they're going to, to, to euthanize it or anything like that. If you're going to relocate it, yeah, I would suspect that they would, they would release it probably in one of the large forest preserves well outside the city. You know, there's a scientific study being done on coyotes in Chicago. Some of them are, are, are tagged and being tracked. What's been learned uh, about them? Yeah, there's a team from Ohio State University that's done a great deal of that work. They learned, for example, what I said earlier, that they look both ways before they cross the street. They've learned that they tend to be more or less monogamous. They tend to sort of mate for life. Um, and they've learned all kinds of different uh, behavioral patterns. They've learned 
to exist in the city. And my team has worked on some of that as well, trying to understand what parts of the city are more likely to attract coyotes. Uh, where is it, for example, that they find to sleep all day? Because they need to find these hidden spaces to sleep the day Have away. you find, found some of those spaces? We have, actually. In, in one case, we found a coyote right next to Lincoln Park Zoo at Nature Boardwalk uh, sleeping <laughs> in a shrub where, you know, hundreds or thousands of people jogged within 10 feet of this coyote all day and none of them uh, were able to spot it. They're very good at hiding, sometimes almost in plain sight. And again, you, you kind of alluded to the fact that if these two bites uh, really did happen from two separate coyotes, that, that perhaps it indicates some kind of disease or what about a lack of food or something like that? Well, this is the time of year that conflicts with coyotes seem to spike, and we think that's probably because their food sources become a little more rare and they have to roam around a little more widely. It's been a very mild winter, so again, it's very surprising that they would really be struggling in that way, but it is something that you think about because this is when they're really having to spread out, cover a lot of territory. I see coyotes much more often this time of year, although usually it's not any cause for concern. And, you know, there have been news reports of some DePaul students that stepped in and saved this kid, so if this coyote was really kind of acting rabid. Does that tell you that, that there's just something off here? There's certainly something off, as I said, whether it's just behavioral because this coyote has learned to associate humans with food in an unhealthy way or whether it is a, a function of some kind of disease, whether that may be rabies or something else. All right, we'll have to learn more about this in the coming days. Seth Magley, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. And up next, Brandis Friedman and the split roiling the British world. Stay with us. Don't miss one of our stories. Get them all delivered to your desktop or mobile device with a subscription to the WTTW News Daily Briefing. Go to WTTW.com slash Daily Briefing and sign up. In a bombshell announcement yesterday, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, Prince Harry and Meghan Markle, announced they are stepping back from the royal family. Here to help us sort out the news, the Megxit is Robert Buchholz, a professor at Loyola University Chicago who specializes in the history of Great Britain. Welcome to Chicago tonight. Thank you for having me. So what do we know about what's happening? What are, what are they saying? Not much. I mean, the, this, the statements from uh, both the Duke and Duchess of Sussex and uh, the royal family have been very cautious. Uh, the statement from the Duke and Duchess was, was more forthcoming, and they basically implied that they wish to no longer participate as actively as they have done in the past, and I think they probably, the implications, they want to sort of pick and choose which events and which activities of the royal family they want to participate in, and they don't necessarily want to live in Britain all the time. The reaction from the palace has been sort of muted and a little bit surprised. The word disappointed was used, which in a royal context carries it's a very strong uh, yeah word. it carries a lot of weight to say that you're disappointed in another member of the royal family is probably not a good sign and I think that's probably a reaction to the fact that they were blindsided by this the monarchy is traditionally very secretive yes they, they don't say a whole lot they're like well remember it's all theater Right, it's all image. It's all, I mean, one way of thinking about the monarchy is we've chosen national symbols, we've chosen a bird, we've chosen a statue in the middle of New York Harbor, uh, we've chosen the flag. They're actual real human beings, and real human beings can be messy and complicated. And so if you are going to present this image of you know, the symbol of the nation, you want to present the most sanitized and welcoming and uh, approving image you possibly can. Now, there's a brand new Royal Sussex website that uh, the, the Duke and Duchess released that apparently um, the palace wasn't uh, aware of when that was going live. Um, but on it, it references, it talks a lot about their funding, and it talks about something called the Sovereign Grant. What yes. is that, and how does this work? The Sovereign Grant is what pays for the public duties of the royal family. Last year, it was 82 million pounds. And the idea is that the British taxpayer pays the royal family to do the duties the royal family does. So when you see the royal family opening a bridge or going on a diplomatic mission and traveling around the countries of the Commonwealth, that is paid for by the sovereign grant. Also the palaces, because they're part of the diplomatic infrastructure of Great Britain. So there's a kind of implicit bargain here. We're, you're 
a member of the royal family. We're going to provide you with a comfortable existence and the greatest medical care in the world, but you have duties to perform. You have a duty to the nation. You are the symbol of the nation. You can't just walk off the job. As you probably know, the queen never gets a day off. The little red boxes that contain all the diplomatic dispatches arrive every day. And there's, there's an expectation on the part of the British people that you don't, you don't shirk this duty. And the Brits kind of see that as, as that, that's the case here, that Prince Harry is efforting, and, and, and Meghan Markle, trying to walk away from some of their duties. Well, it's early days, and I think the press coverage is somewhat split. Of course, there's lots of people saying, particularly young people, and uh, some of the more, probably the more liberal media are saying, hey, good for them. You know, the monarchy needs to be shaken up. They were never comfortable. This is all part of their sort of outreach to a wider world, and that is one possible way of looking at it. Now, I'm a historian, so I'm going to look at this in the long-term context, and I'm thinking of the precedents. Um, Edward VIII and Wallace Simpson, the Duke and Duchess of Windsor, uh, Sarah Ferguson, Duchess of York, Princess Diana, uh, uh, very recently Prince Andrew and Prince Philip. You'll notice none of these precedents are real happy ones in terms of how they ended up. So uh, I think that uh, Harry and Meghan have chosen an, um, a difficult path. Well, they also say they want to become financially independent, that they value, um, you know, kind of making their own income. I mean, is he going to start collecting money from a speaking cir circuit? She can't go back to acting, possibly. Well, exactly. I mean, you'll remember the, the great example here is the Duchess of York, who uh, became a spokesperson for Weight Watchers and engaged in all sorts of sort of commercial enterprises that some people felt sort of tarnished the in image of the monarchy. But it, it, once you make this decision, you're kind of between a rock and a hard place. What You, you have to make money. You have to survive. What, what do you do? Especially when, they've, when they're accustomed to living so comfortably. That's exactly right. Remember that uh, they're living in a house, uh, at Frogmore House, on the grounds of Windsor Castle. And to renovate Frogmore House to be suitable for um, uh, the Duke and Duchess, uh, the British people spent something like 2.5 million pounds. Are they going to pay that back? I don't know, not if they're not yeah. living there. Um, <laughs> so we're also hearing that the Queen um, asked them to wait, as you mentioned this, and that they have said that they um, intend to continue supporting the monarchy uh, when the queen should call upon them. But what's the likelihood that she's going to continue to ask them to represent her um, now that this this divide has been drawn? Well, I guess it depends on how strong we think the divide is. I mean, this could be seen as we, we need a little bit of breathing space. We need time to raise our family. She will certainly be sympathetic to that because, remember, she never got that time because of the early death of her father. She had to take over as queen very, very early on. And there's a sense of regret ar ar around that, around not having that chance to be with her children. At the same time, uh, you could also see this as an act of disloyalty, perhaps even betrayal to the idea of families. How often do we tell our family, I'm no longer going to be part of this, or at least part of the family business anymore. It's a very difficult thing. So uh, one of the things in the Buckingham Palace statement was that uh, they, they have to work out the details. And I think that's, uh, this will all work out in time. More to come. Bob Buckholtz, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. And we're back in a moment with an encore presentation of Ask Jeffrey. Stick around. What do a 1917 march down Michigan Avenue and a 1934 record-breaking train run have in common? Publicity. Jeffrey Bear is here with stories of two Chicago publicity stunts, because, hey, they don't call it the Windy City for nothing. Am I right, Jeffrey? <laughs> that is absolutely why it's <laughs> called the Windy you. City. Good to see you, too. So our first question, it comes from Diana Springfield in Springfield. She writes, I found an old stereoscopic postcard in a yard sale showing a huge parade on Michigan Avenue in 1917. What can you tell me about the event? So Diana sent us a cell phone picture of the postcard, so not great quality, but it really caught our attention. So we went to the Library of Congress and we found a really good quality copy of it. There's the photo. Uh, it's captioned, thousands marching, thousands watching our National Army, Chicago, August 4th, 1917. Okay, so that's about a year too early to be a World War I victory parade. What mm -hmm. was it for? Good knowledge of history there. Thank you. It was essentially a, a big 
propaganda stunt that was cooked up to um, uh, promote the new idea of drafting men into the army, which was a new thing then. Um, the United States had declared war on Germany a few months earlier, and there were only about 121,000 men in the uh, army at that time. It was called the regular, quote, the regular army. Um, so the federal government authorized the Selective Service Act of May 1917. It required all men aged 21 to 30 to register for the draft, and those selected would be conscripted into something new, something called the National Army. And um, so this was real about face for a country that had um, until that point maintained a neutral position in this growing conflict overseas. President Wilson quickly authorized a campaign to gin up support for the draft and the war. Um, it was led by something called the Committee on Public Information, or CPI, <laughs> sure. Information. Uh, and the CPI flooded newsrooms with stories, many of which the newspapers printed verbatim. Um, they sent a, sent uh, also sent around 75,000 speakers called the Four Minute Men. Uh, they went all over the country and gave these four minute short speeches promoting Wilson's war plans. No Twitter back then. No. Uh, and they produced propaganda films and created stirring posters, including this one, uh, the famous Uncle Sam Wants You. So then was this parade a CPI event? Uh, not directly. It may have had something to do with CPI, um, but it appears to have been a homegrown affair um, inspired by an editorial that was printed in the, um, in the Chicago Tribune. Um, after the editorial ran, a, a local committee was formed. Um, the Trib then ran ads for, from the committee and uh, articles inviting men who had been drafted uh, into the army. Uh, they were invited to march in this huge parade so the city could give them a proper send-off for their military training. And just weeks after the editorial ran in the paper, 13,477 soon-to-be soldiers uh, in civilian clothes marched up Michigan Avenue behind officers in training from Fort Sheridan. Uh, now 35 uh, of those men whose draft number had come up first. They were called the, the 258 men because their draft number was 258. So their number had come up first, these 35 men, and they were given the honor of leading the enlistees in this parade and they were loudly cheered by the throngs along the street, all this according to the Tribune. Um, uh, the reviewing stand was in front of the Art Institute where recruited, uh, where, where um, U.S. Army Major General Thomas H. Berry observed the recruits, uh, Lieutenant John Philip Sousa, the March King himself, directed the Great Lakes Naval Training Band. Um, and immediately following the parade, Barry wrote, quote, no other city in the United States or in the world ever witnessed a finer sight than the parade composed solely of young American manhood uh, without a slacker in the bunch. Woe betide those whom they go up against on the other side. Interesting, Jeffrey. Thank you. Okay, sure our next one comes from Karen Knapp of Woodstock. She writes, many years ago, my grandmother gave me a framed document because she thought I might be able to use the frame. The document is the log of the Burlington Denver Zephyr world record nonstop run on October 23rd, 1936. It says that John T. Peary was a passenger and that he is therefore a member of the Dawn to Dusk Club. What can you tell me about it? Uh, don't you love this? Here, maybe you just like the frame, right? And then, but do you <laughs> look at it? There's historical document something inside. In the, yeah, I mean, I, we, we just love these. So our viewer <laughs> sent us a photo of the certificate. So let's start out by taking a look at that. Um, so at first, I assumed that this was the super sleek train that many of us have seen at the Museum of Science and Industry, the Burlington Pioneer Zephyr, which in fact made a record breaking run from Denver to Chicago, but that was in 1934. Um, it is the same streamlined design, but it's actually a different train. This is the Denver Zephyr, and this run was two years later in 1936. So, okay, let's back up a bit. Um, the legendary streamliner I referred to, the one that's at the Museum of Science and Industry, um, set its record-breaking dawn to dusk run on May 16, 1934. Um, and that, as we said at the beginning, was a publicity stunt by the Burlington, uh, Chicago, Burlington and Quincy Railroad to demonstrate a revolutionary new kind of lightweight, high speed train powered by a diesel engine instead of by steam. Railroads were desperate for new efficient technology that would cut costs as ridership was slumping during the Great Depression. Okay, so Burling, Pre Burlington President um, Ralph Budd wanted this to be literally the last word in trains, so he scouted around for a name that started with Z, 
Uh, he found inspiration in the name of the god of the west wind, Zephyrus. Look at it go, man, look at that. Um, the goal was to cover the distance in 14 hours, uh, which is actually five hours shorter than the old Denver to Chicago records, which was set by a steam engine, and nearly half the regular time of 26 hours. Um, the big finale was to be the Zephyrus' triumphant arrival at Chicago's Century of Progress World's Fair reopening. So did the train make it on time? It got here early. How about that? Hmm. Um, the Zephyr covered 1,000 uh, and 15 miles in just over 13 hours. You want to take a guess at what the fuel cost was? I the total up. cost of fuel? The total, $15. $14.64. I was so close. You were. <laughs> uh, the, the run and subsequent 31 state publicity tour made the Zephyr a bona fide star. It even starred in a Hollywood movie, The Silver Streak. Um, it was put into regular service from Lincoln to Kansas City in November 1934. Okay, so fast forward to 1936. Um, two new 12 car Zephyrs, same streamlined design, but much larger, much more powerful, were built for regular uh, runs between Denver and Chicago. And so Bud kicked off the service with another publicity stunt. He wanted to break the record of the first Zephyr. So passengers on this 1936 train apparently did receive these certificates, like the one our viewer sent us. Uh, uh, this particular one she sent us was issued to John T. Peary, which is funny because he was, you know, the Carson Peary Scott store. Of course. Um, so we only see these in museums today and not out on the tracks. Why is that? Well, um, Begin, it's amazing, isn't it? We used to have high-speed rail in this country, but beginning in the 1950s, you have the interstate highway system, you have you know, the, the growth of air travel, railroads go into a, a long, slow decline. Um, the original Zephyr uh, made its last run in 1960 and then was sent to the museum, but the name lives on in Amtrak's California Zephyr. So it had a good long run. Not quite the last word in trains, though, was it? <laughs> no, Amtrak, back to A. Back to A. Oh, you've got it. Thank you, Jeffrey. Good sure to see thing. you. And you can march on over to our website where you'll find more on these and other Ask Jeffrey questions. And don't forget to send in your own questions about Chicago to Jeffrey Bear. And we're back right after this. Ask Jeffrey on Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Benny's Beverage Depot. In 1948, Benny's Beverage Depot opened its first store down the street from Wrigley Field. And for over 70 years, Benny's mission has remained the same, helping you celebrate the best times of your life. Last night, we took you behind the scenes to see the young video producers in the Free Spirit Media program making their latest projects. Free Spirit is a Chicago organization dedicated to helping teens and young adults with media literacy, as well as providing opportunities to gain hands-on media production experience. WTTW News is partnering with Free Spirit to work with the students and to showcase some of their work. Tonight, we want to share with you one of the projects we referenced last night. In this story, students provide a fresh take on how different cultures have adopted hairstyles popularized by the African-American community. Hair in society is often viewed as a form of creativity, and it's a way that people can express themselves. The African-American community has taken on social platforms by introducing their own twists on styles, such as extensions, braids, and of course, the infamous Afro. It has been seen recently that other cultures adopting African-American hairstyles, which has caused some controversy. We spoke to a few black women and asked about their opinion on the matter. I believe that black hair has shaped society because black people have shaped society. And anything that comes from black people naturally is going to play a heavy role in shaping our society. Historically, it can be seen as negative, what they call nappy. But uh, for my understanding, I don't believe in nappy. I believe in coiled to kinky to curly. So for me, black hair is having creative hair. There have been some mixed emotions across the nation on how African-Americans hair is viewed. Also in the recent past, there have been a few instances where African-Americans were judged and forced to change up their hairstyles. There was a time when you did not see women on the news or in um, on TV shows with natural hairstyles. But now uh, we're really celebrating individualism, so it's really whatever you can think of, you can wear. Although there are other cultures adopting hairstyles from the African American community, it should only be right that those same people stand in favor and advocate for black issues. I feel like it's okay but like I feel like also feel like they are not um, accepting of who we are and wh what we do. 
because like you can um you can wear our culture you can represent and all but you can also be there for us when times are tough and like when we really need you guys not when you guys want to help us in our culture and represent it in your own way i do not feel offensive when any ethnic group um, wears any styles any style that comes from the quote unquote the black community because we are all human and hair is expression and people express themselves through hair so i don't think any human has the right to tell another human being what style they can't and can't wear i might be shocked but i'm not offended my opinion on other races adopting uh, black hairstyles i do see it as cultural appropriation mainly because many of them do not have the hair texture to actually carry our styles but also a lot of our hairstyles are rooted in um, many different meanings, even including slave escapes as well. So I feel that if they don't really have a purpose or if they um, don't really understand protective styling or why we style our hair, it can come off as offensive. And that story was created by Crystal Hall, Kendall Gray, Dejanae Fletcher, and Namaya Collins, all of whom took part in the Free Spirit Media South program this fall. You can see more stories from the young producers of Free Spirit Media on our website, and we'll be continuing our partnership with the program, and we'll share more of their productions later in the year. Very good story. Well done. And that's our show for this Thursday night. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily briefing. And you can get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and our website, wttw.com news. And you can also get the show via podcast and the PBS video app. And please join us tomorrow night at 7 for the Week in Review. And now, now for, for all, all of us here, here in Chicago tonight. tonight, I'm Brandis Friedman. And I'm Paris Schutz. Thank you for watching. Good night. Closed captioning for this program is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, pleased to give back to the community through numerous charitable initiatives.